To our returning audience, welcome back. And to our first time viewers, thanks for being here. Canvas is a concert series that explores the connection between music and the human experience. We create programs that pair live music with art, history, and science. In normal times, we'd be with you in person. But in the meantime, we're glad you're here with us online. Tonight, we get a sneak peek at the life and artistry of touring musician Angie Swan. Angie has shared the world's finest stages with pop icons such as Will I Am, CeeLo Green, and Fifth Harmony. In recent years, Angie has become the guitarist with David Byrne's American Utopia Project. She joins us from New York to talk about music, life, and the importance of diverse investments, both real and metaphorical. But first, a look at some music news. <laughs> The year that came in like Groban and left like Osborne. Up until March, we're all busy doing what we do, you know, eating inside, touching door handles, breathing on each other. And then overnight, toilet paper became an acceptable birthday present, and an 80-year-old immunologist got nominated for People's Sexiest Man Alive. The music world flipped too. Musicians went from playing Carnegie in Madison Square Garden to playing cars and halls that seat 2,000 plants. Yes, times changed, and it's been hard for everyone. Even if you've been lucky enough to keep your health and your job, 2020 felt like showing up for rehearsal only to find out you're playing a John Adams concert every day for the next 344 days. Schools went online in March, forcing teachers to face the music. In the spirit of camaraderie, they turned to each other, sharing resources to help with the transition. Hey, so as some of you guys might know, I'm a music teacher and I found that one of the best ways that I can process the whole transition to online learning and teaching is to write a song. So I wrote a song. I'd like to share that with you guys now. Here we go. Educators report that technical progress in young students is nearly ground to a halt. Instructors are sobbing into their N95, seeing on Zoom that Jimmy's bowl hold now looks like he's headed to Sturgis. And then there are the ensembles. For musicians of all ages, the absence of making music together as a group has been really painful. Directors have taken on the challenge of creating the group videos that are now commonplace on the internet to help make us feel better. But there's nothing common about what goes into making these videos. There's cutting, pasting, editing out the barking dog, overdubbing the part that somehow got played in a different key, and in many instances, teaching people how to play to clicks, which adds an additional burden of self-doubt for teachers. How do my students not know how to keep tempo? Where are the metronomes? And at the end of the day, it still may not turn out how you want. Oh, Social distance choir. It's a lot to handle. <laughs> so cheers to all of you music teachers who are sticking to the score. And here's to all the weird stuff you've seen during your Zoom lessons. You know, like Cheeto consumption while playing. People randomly walking into view partially clothed, and a close-up of your students' cats behind. The upside to it all, your relationship with students really matter. Kids are resilient, and pants are optional. Music retailers enjoyed an increase in sales during the pandemic. Acoustic guitars, keyboards, and ukuleles have been flying off virtual shelves for months. Not violas, they're still there. Ah yes, the lure of learning an instrument. The romantic notion of it is as thick as aerosol droplets in a choir room. 
you pick up that new instrument, it's like you're sitting next to a stream with butterflies in the air. Oh, is that a deer sneaking up behind you to hear you play? <laughs> Thanks to a discount code at Guitar Center, you're sure you found your once and forever hobby. Oh, your friends may tell you this is just a pandemic thing. Your music obsession isn't going to last. Or they may say that being on furlough shouldn't have meant that you officially quit that job to pursue your lifelong dream of playing oboe in the goth metal band. But you know what I say? I say sit down at that keyboard and play tale as old as time until your neighbors call the police. Is the learning curve harder to flatten than the second wave? Absolutely. Will you likely quit by this time next year? Without a doubt. But if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that you've got to enjoy what you have today. So blow, pluck, and play away, my friends. Carpe instrumentum. <laughs> Ah, trumpets, those beacons of musical confidence, the perennial announcers of stuff, are now announcing... <laughs> hear ye, hear ye, here comes some COVID. So apparently, forcefully pushing saliva-laced air through a tiny hole while secreting slightly from the nose and eventually dumping a half cup of spit on the floor is not so good in a pandemic. A team of mechanical engineers tested wind players for aerosol spread, and as it turns out, Trumpets are the worst offenders. But never fear, thanks to an amazing new invention, these lions of the orchestra remain unfettered and unafraid. That's right, trumpet players, you will remain the fruit of your ensemble's loom. If you buy this mask today, you can make your absence brief. But when you go back to rehearsals, be sure to duck under. Duck under, you say? Under where? Under the radar of spreading droplets by wearing this super weird looking face mask. That's where. So teachers are hustling, instrument sales are up, and inventors are working to get musicians safely back to rehearsal halls. Have I missed anything? Oh, right. The complete abandonment of music performances around the globe causing an entire industry to collapse, careers to be rerouted in the face of music potentially changed forever. Right. I knew I was forgetting something. COVID brain. The list of losses is long. Musicians and venues were forced to rewrite plans or even draft bankruptcy papers. In the U.S. alone, over 170,000 live music-related jobs have been eliminated, and that number is just the tip of Bjork's Icelandic iceberg. Many artists work multiple jobs to make ends meet, and many of those jobs and industries, like hospitality and food services, have also shut down. And common sense tells you that gathering thousands of people to breathe on each other for two hours is going to be the last of our privileges to return. Well, that and shared salad tongs at Chuckaramas. It's going to take a lot of effort to get musical life back on its feet. So when the world reopens, people buy the tickets and go to the show, even if traffic on the 405 is backed up from here to the valley. How things been in this pandemic? I know. I miss live music too, Nodi. What? You were about to go on tour? With Andrea Bocelli? I did not see that coming. Uh, Nodi, does Mr. Bocelli realize that you're not, you know, human in form? I, I mean, no offense. I know you can play well. It's just, you know, maybe he didn't know. Oh, you turned on Taylor Swift for Bocelli? Do you regret that decision? Of course you don't. You're incapable of regret. You don't fret about anything. You're fretless. Well, Nodi, I'm sorry to go, but I gotta wrap up this news segment and so all the people here can get to know Angie Swan. Please say hi to Mrs. The Kitty. Make sure you wash your paws. Two full cycles of happy birthday. Take care of yourself, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, Nodi.
2019, composer David Lang premiered the following piece, the timing of which would prove beyond ironic. Protect yourself from infection. Keep well and don't get hysterical. Francis Brumble. 
Samuel Lancaster. Beyond the cherry popsicle stain on your favorite white t-shirt that is COVID-19, 2020 also showed again that the devastating disease upon which our nation was founded is alive and well. And neither bleach nor vaccinations are going to stop it in its tracks. We're an organization that tells music stories. Canvas is fully aware that entire genres like jazz, blues, and hip-hop came into being to express musically the suppression of Black voices and bodies. We're also aware that the long accepted definition of what is exceptional music mostly belongs to a small group of long dead white guys. We're also aware that policies banked against black families make access to instruments and education infinitely more challenging for black kids than for white kids. Canvas brings people together to explore humanity through a musical lens. We consider it a responsibility to seek challenging conversations throughout this musical journey together. We're not going to shy away from talking about race and prejudice, nor are we afraid to question history or the present. And we're still Canvas. We're still the place to laugh and cry and play boom whackers and learn about music and musicians. Like tonight, we've got Angie Swan with us. She's going to share her story of becoming a touring artist giving us a sneak peek behind David Byrne's American Utopia project and talking about the impact of 2020 on her life as a musician. So thanks again for choosing to spend time with us tonight. And now, Angie Swan. It's a constant hustle. I always say, if you're not working, you're at home working on working, always trying to come up with another plan because it was definitely a roller coaster ride the whole way through. I caught up with guitarist Angie Swan to learn about her life as a performing artist in LA, New York, and beyond. David Byrne, let's, let's talk about David Byrne. His idea of what a utopia could be when it comes to diversity and love and inclusion, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully that translates on stage and then is carried on off stage. Uh, that's, that's the dream. Someone told me I was the love child between Ellen DeGeneres and Prince. And I'm like, I don't think those two would have ever hooked up, but thank you, you know, uh, myself as well as some of the other uh, black musicians or musicians of color in the band, you know, that could easily be us. Angie shares extraordinary stories about the challenges and opportunities attached to her life in music. Stick around so you can listen differently. Okay, what's another one? A button! Okay, yeah, that's good. Come on. Angie Swan. I'm currently on tour with David Byrne, formerly from the Talking Heads. I'm his lead guitar player. I've played with many artists in the past, including CeeLo Green, Will I Am, Macy Gray, Cirque du Soleil, Fifth Harmony, and that's just to name a few. We're not just 
standing in place performing on our instrument. Every song has a specific step that goes with each note you play. To be able to play with such a variety of bands and projects, you have to really be open to adapting to different situations. I've told this to students before, playing less is more. You have to put your ego aside, and it's just a matter of being focused and not being afraid to try new things. When I tell people I play to be some way that you don't feel comfortable being, always just be true to yourself, and no matter what, I think that's gonna shine through. Thank you for being here. Happy to be here, thank you. draw on the walls at home. <laughs> my mother hated it, my dad hated it, but they started giving me just tons and tons of paper. Instead of taking away my crayons, they'd give me paper. And because I, I grew up in a very musical family. My dad used to have band rehearsals in our basements. Uh, I would smell those funny cigarettes, which I realized wasn't tobacco. We won't talk about that. <laughs> but um, jazz cabbage. Uh, you know, even before guitar, I played violin, piano, clarinet, but guitar was the one thing that I would practice without my parents forcing me to practice so they could tell I was kind of <laughs> hooked on that one. My, my mother said I used to listen to the Culture Club a lot. I had like Boy George, nice. I couldn't tell if it was a man or woman, but I had this like infatuation with with, with them at the time and I was just like, oh my God, who is this? And I think androgyny always fascinated me, even as a young age, at a young age. Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, Robert Cray, Bonnie Raitt was huge influence for me, just seeing her, um, you know, seeing this woman play guitar, Jennifer Batten, um, and then, you know, go like, like jazz, Dave Brubeck, Take Five, even as like eight, nine years old, I was loving that song. So I could see all these concerts. I think I saw Prince in 96. But again, I'm supposed to be working, but I was really paying attention. I remember thinking, I, I want to be on one of those stages one day. Both, depends on the time of day. Fertilized, but I'll say poached. Come on, Dunch. Oh, Batman. Ooh, Nike, of course. Oh, bike. My mother's a three-time senior citizen Olympics ping pong champion. Um, in honor of her, you know, because she's probably gonna watch this video, I will say table tennis. Ooh, I mean, it depends on the ramen. I haven't, oh, that's a tough one. I would, I would say thing. ramen. I'll say ramen. Ooh, soda, I can't, man, people up north, northern Wisconsin, Chicago, and down in Chicago, they say pop, like soda. Wisconsin cheese is lecker. Hey, look at that. <laughs> Currently, New York. I'll have to say, in, in the current conditions, we're in, I will say New York, or went to LA with a dream, but I realized the dream in New York. I flipped a coin, actually. I was like, <laughs> choosing it over Juilliard. I, I was more interested in contemporary music and jazz and world music, whereas I feel like I felt like other programs were just very traditional to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I see Berkeley more as a laboratory versus a conservatory where you're yeah. constantly creating and being innovative versus doing the same thing again. Audition for Berkeley on cassette tapes. When I got to Berkeley, started doing my school projects, they were on cassette tapes or mini discs or CD then CDs. By the time I left Berkeley, things that were becoming digital. And also, while I was in school, the music industry was changing. Once once things became more digital, people started downloading music for free, which kind of hurt the music industry because they were losing money because people were taking stuff for free, and that kind of was like a reality check, which I didn't know was gonna happen until I got out of school and got to LA and realized that what people were making when I was in school was gonna drastically change by the time I got out of school and started my career. I was told to go to jam sessions, go meet people, go sit in. So many times where I'd come and, you know, I was shy, walk in with your guitar and, you know, not as much confidence as I would have like to have had and speaking to the band leader during the break and you know woman's approaching them they might think you're just hitting on them i'm like oh yeah i play guitar they're like yeah yeah we'll get you up we'll get you up 
but you almost have to be vouched for because they don't want to just bring up a stranger and then you suck and then they're like, you know, it just kind of ruins the night. So it's really? hard because then you also have to have a job and to, mm -hmm. to be able to supplement being in LA because the cost of living is just way larger than, you know, in the Midwest. typical very feminine dressing long hair I kind of have more of an androgynous look I guess and you know even the term female maybe I have gender dysphoria because sometimes I hate using the term think like a guy but uh -huh. you know you, you have to you know forget having balls because those things are sensitive you got to have strong eggs and um <laughs> and I think I yeah yeah fertilized yeah <laughs> but or not but you know um <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I, even the term female, you know, when people, I hate when people go, you're good, dot, 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 for a girl. Uh -huh, right. That's that's like the biggest backhanded compliment. Um, now, mm -hmm. if, if I call myself female, it's spelled F-E-E-M-A-L-E. -E -E. Pay me like you pay a guy. Female. <laughs> that's, that's what I say now. So. <laughs> Saying yes to something putting a little fire under you so you have to learn how to do it like even playing little percussive parts percussion yes, um, yes. just being kind of a jack of all trades right and a master of nothing you know that's how I did TV shows I did a, a show on MTV called rock the cradle and I was just kind of like the auxiliary player where I would do guitar or I would have a tambourine and sing <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna go fast forward a couple years to when we met and you came and through our mutual friend, Jason, you came and played guitar on our um, Bohemian Rhapsody. That was fun. That was a fun show. Those were some crazy guitar parts to try to learn. <laughs> I never really studied or listened to a lot of Queen until that moment. I mean, I've, I've always been a fan. I knew their music. I knew their work. But that was like the first time I actually delved into it to a point of, oh, my God, this stuff's ridiculous. And then knowing like, aren't, isn't he like a rocket scientist or something? Just a brilliant person. <laughs> yeah. And um, now I'm kind of like a like a six degrees of separation, having worked with um, uh, Adam Lambert, who now sings in place of Freddie oh, Mercury yeah. for Queen. Yeah. So, you know, and I had to learn more Queen songs. We did Good Morning America maybe two years ago in, in Central Park. And, oh. you know, it's just like that now one degree of separation from, you know, started back then when I did the Canvas uh, Queen performance. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. I know people who can play stuff completely verbatim and, you know, even just getting, for me, it's more, get the tone. The tone is really important to me uh -huh. um, when speaking mm -hmm. or playing. Um, and that's like, like almost like, um, who is it? Like the edge, I can't call him like a sonic genius because he comes up with these crazy sounds and stuff. And it's just, yeah. it's, you know, having your signature sound, um, you know, and mm -hmm. I think definitely bright, you can listen to it because there are too many people nowadays that want to imitate versus emulate and then you don't have your own voice. And I had to take off a month of school, month and a half in the middle of the school year. So I had to go to all my professors, tell them how this was a big opportunity. And, you know, some of them were like, oh, you're missing a lot of work. And I'm like, well, mm. you know, this is kind of what I came to school for to be right. able to perform. And oh, I think my first professional tour was with Will I Am uh, from Black Eyed Peas. I was playing with him and Nicole Scherzinger from Pussycat Dolls. They had a project together at the time. Lots of in-town gigs in LA, like kind of, you know, spreading myself kind of thin, just doing gigs where I could, making a couple hundred bucks here, 50 bucks there. And mm -hmm. so it was, it was a lot, you know, because you're driving around this, this crazy city, high gas prices and just trying to make it work like 
it's a constant hustle. I always say, if you're not working, you're at home working on working, always trying to come up with another plan. Cause it was definitely mm -hmm. a roller coaster ride the whole way through. Cause you think the momentum will never come back down. Hmm. And so you're like, Oh, this is all these great hotel rooms and stuff. But then the reality sets back in and you're back home and you don't know when the next paycheck's coming. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, what are you going to do with that? And, um, so that was hard. I mean, I, I've had to pawn off instruments to pay rent, you know, and, and I'm like, I'll try to make the money back in time to get to the pawn shop and get my equipment back. And sometimes I would, a lot of times I wouldn't. So my mother especially was very supportive. My, you know, my dad was supportive, like just very, you know, like encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, realistically, you know, it's, it, it was rough. It was really hard and trying to figure out how to make, you know, and it's still, it still is to this day, you never know what's going to happen the next day. So, you know, again, trial and error over, over a decade of doing this, I've learned from mistakes and, Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think it's, I don't think you ever lose. It's always just a lesson. It's not a mistake. It's a lesson. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. as long as you don't keep going in, you know, the same repetitive motion, mm -hmm. uh, you can kind of come out on top. Um, cause again, like Los Angeles was crazy and like ups and downs, ups and downs. And I was like about to give up on music. I'm like, I, I can't afford to keep staying in LA with, with the lack of work I have right now. I actually didn't even have a car at the time. My car got totaled well, parked on the street and I didn't have liability insurance or I didn't have uh, some kind of insurance. So I lost my, so I was in LA like the last six months there with no car. I was taking hundred dollar taxis to a $75 gig. Oh <laughs> All right, you, you got the gig, but you have to be in Montreal in three days. Oh <laughs> It was all females and I was on stage as well. Uh, no, um, <laughs> it was based on Romeo and Juliet and The Tempest, uh, the show Amaluna that I did yeah. with Cirque du Soleil. Pictures of like how, how long are your fingers for costume fittings. They had all your measurements, uh, your blood type it was just very, very particular. And that's, they're very intricate. And that's why they have such beautiful costumes. And they just pay attention to every single detail. And it was just like, what? It was intense, but it was like, it was a leap of faith. I just said, you know, mom, I'm moving to Montreal in uh, 72 hours. And the whole notion of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, maybe that was set 60s, 70s, 80s, but, um, you know, you had a good time, but it wasn't like, it was a lot of early lobby calls, <laughs> like, you know, you, you get on a bus, go to the venue, do the show. Very often, very few times would you get to see the cities. Um, you know, with American Utopia, it was a little better. We had a couple of days off to explore mm -hmm. via bicycle, which is awesome. All right, it's a lot on the body. It's a lot if you have a significant other and they're far away, the time zone yeah. difference. Um, so, but you have to be really present, you know, and, and stay, mm -hmm. you know, stay healthy. I, I mean, I've had wild tours, but as I've gotten older, I've definitely you know, take care of myself. You have to have a routine, something you like to do, um, stay hydrated. Three and, three and four, three and three four. and four. All right. Oh, this is good. Queen, the magic tour, 1986 Queen. You're on. And number four is Janet Jackson, Rhythm Nation. Hey. Hey, uh, with Janet, I probably want to just see if I could be a dancer because I have two left feet. I can't dance, so I just want to do that oddball doing all the wrong on the other side. Well, they're all like doing all their all their stuff. With Queen, I probably want to be like Brian May's tech because he's such a genius. I'd want to like tune all the strings just to him once, put all the like G, like six six G strings and just see what he did with it. Handle, I mean, I'd probably lose my job after that, but I feel like he'd be able to like compensate for it and just be like, like killing it regardless. But yeah, okay. he, one was the Rolling Stones, 1965. Oh, wow. One was Prince and the Revolution, Purple Rain, Woo! 1984, yeah. 1985. Mm -hmm. Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. I wouldn't have remembered that. <laughs> it was all a blur. And here's the last one, just for fun, Talking Heads. 
their closing tour, Speaking in Tongues, 1983. Oh, oh my God. Wow. That would have been something. <laughs> I wonder how it would have been if I met the, the, the younger David Burr. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I've read stories. I've read books. I've talked to him. So, you know, like even as he said, he's changed over the years. So I could not fathom who he was back then. I, do, I don't know. I don't know. Well, such a tattoo. Well, how did I get here? Um, which is a lyric from uh, Once in a Lifetime. You know, Will, how did I get here? And I feel like that's a very broad question. You know, I could, you know, be in, on any stage. I, I ask myself that, how did I get here? Or, or in, a, in a different city or at a restaurant or in a situation with a person, you know, like just, you know, like how, how did I end up where I am right now? David Byrne. Let's let's talk about David Byrne. Do you need Who's to that? <laughs> well, that was actually the first photo we had ever taken together. That was our first photo ever. I'm the one on the right, in case nobody knows. <laughs> you know, I didn't hear from them for about a month. And then in my junk mailbox, I find this letter. It says from David Byrne. It says, my tour and you. And this is like a public service announcement. Kids always check your junk. But <laughs> because if I hadn't looked in that, I, I need to frame that letter. If I hadn't looked there, and it was just really short and just very like written very simply. It's just like, hi, period. I think it's like, my name's David Byrne, period. Uh, I have this tour coming up. It's probably different than anything you've ever done before. Uh, would you be interested? Uh, I hope so. What if we could eliminate everything from the stage except the stuff we care about the most? Without cables or wires, what would be left? Well, it would be us and you. And that's what the show is. As people, we're a work in progress. Who we are, it extends beyond ourselves. To the connections between all of us. very representative I think of how David is he's just very he's very visual but then you know he loves certain types of music so you have the audio and visual he just wanted to make like a pretty much like a moving ex it's an exhibit it's an exhibit with a mess with a very powerful message his idea of what a utopia could be when it comes to diversity and love and inclusion mm -hmm. um, and hopefully that translates on stage and then is carried on off stage uh, that's that's the dream mm -hmm. um, and you know I think it was you know it was very important to him to have a diverse group too I'm sure that was his vision because you know you can't have a show called American Utopia and a, a billboard of an old white guy he's not old I shouldn't say old but it's true it's true I mean no it's a it's a diversity thing um, and it, it would hopefully be more than a gimmick um mm -hmm. but you know i mean because we're all i feel like we're all different ingredients that come together and you we can't do something without the other people without the other person so that's that's what i think would be what the utopia could be the, the inclusion equality um, mm -hmm. more than equality equity members it, they didn't like it I where is it Tampa Florida one guy gets up and flips us off when we're singing the song that Janelle Monet uh, mm -hmm. wrote called hell you talking about uh where we're talking about police shootings and victims and the lyrics were just you know Eric Gardner say his name both of John say his name and and one guy stood up flipped us off screams out bullshit and walks off and other people have actually said to us at the show, you know, the show is good, but 
that song ruined it for me or or and I'm like you're telling this to a black woman right now or people like yeah you could have done without doing that song and that was kind of off-putting you know it kind of hurt a little bit yeah um, the frequency of it as well and and you know people oh don't make it political and I'm like is it really a political thing to talk about you know police violence or people not people not receiving justice for something mm -hmm. um so you know it's a message that hopefully registers with the majority because it's an ongoing issue and you know uh, myself as well as some of the other uh black musicians or musicians of color in the band you know that could easily be us mm -hmm. and if you're not in that position to see it you don't you have your blinders on because it doesn't happen to you so you don't you don't think it happens to anyone because it doesn't happen to you and so yeah. and to speak about it openly i think is the first step into you know acknowledging it that it happens and then being more aware of it happening and stopping it when it happens is, is important there were some shows in the u.s where we sang and like eric gardner's mother was in the audience hmm. or uh one woman i can't remember who there's so many victims it hurts me so much to talk about it one woman comes up to us backstage after the show and she's like, I'm the person that filmed that police shooting and I didn't know you were gonna say his name and thank you, she's just crying, just made me, brought me to tears. She's like, thank you so much for acknowledging it and So I was being interviewed by MTV and they started asking me about race and I came out saying, I am racist. Then I had to explain what I meant. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is if you grow up in a country that is racist, that has systemic racism, it is put into you. No matter what you want to believe or what you tell yourself, it's in you. What year was this? Around the 80s. And so you've been woke for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> for a minute. For a minute. And that's why I love my brother right here. There's no Johnny come lately, Black Lives Matter. Nah, nah, nah. He was, he was down. Uh, with us. And I think Spike at this moment was the best choice, mm -hmm. you know, especially with what the show was about. And it just like, the way he filmed it was so beautiful where the cameras would be on stage and it's like 3D, you mm -hmm. know, you, just having that different perspective. Um, yeah. If you had already seen the show versus if you've only seen the movie. Right. Because the camera's only showing this portion and that portion, but yeah, the whole throughout the whole show, we're all dancing. Everything is intentional. We had this organization called headcount.org and in the US we had um, uh, like booths set up in the lobbies to help people get registered. And, you know, it was around the voting season. So it made sense. Hmm. Um, you know, he'd talk about statistics of how many people are registered versus how many people would actually go out and vote. Mm -hmm. Kind of the, the grassroots ha hands-on stuff versus the huge federal stuff. You really need to start with the small little pegs that hold everything else up. David's first email he sent me, he said, there's going to be some dancing. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do a statement. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to do a two step. And then Amy B. Parson comes in with all these movements. And I'm like, are you serious? Are you serious? And uh, she's super patient, super creative, and just very minimalist. Like, just the, just the smallest little movements may have the biggest impact. And, and you know, like, sometimes she want to do a lot of dance stuff, but we have to re remind her, like, hey, we have to play the parts here. And she's like, oh, that's unfortunate. But I'm like, uh, yeah, and there's one part where I'm playing consistent 16th notes, but all down strokes, like da 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 da. My, my left uh -huh. hand's going in circles, like like our singing yeah. ball. <laughs> and I'm kind of using my left hand as like a, a metronome, one e and a two e and a three uh -huh. and a four e and a da 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 da. -da, -da. So that's kind of how I was able to keep doing that. The state, but everything is intentional. The reason we wore gray suits is because the light reflects better off where you can change the color of the suits. If the light goes red, we're red. If the light's blue, we're blue. So how long did it take you to learn the whole show? The choreography and then the music, I was curious, did you learn from charts? Did you learn from tracks? How do you- uh, Both, charts and tracks. Uh, we were given a score. Um, uh, that was hard. We, we picked like two or three songs at a time, learned for a week. Uh, we had about four weeks. Like I, I am, I am, we started, I think, February 2018. 
started rehearsing and then our first show, trial show was in March, like a month later. So we were wow. learning the, the music and the steps at the same time, which I think was helpful because it's like, all right, when I'm playing this, I'll be doing this physically. Oh, my kids! The thing on the right, that's solid black, that's, that's uh, called a Nags guitar. And the one you're seeing in the middle, uh, Joe Nags also made that. That, that model's called the Severn guitar. and. He came and saw our show, and then he built that guitar because he looked at the color of the stage. He he memorized. Look at the gray. How the gray yeah. on the guitar matches the gray on the stage. Uh, the, the, the dance floor is called a Marley, uh -huh. and he um, and then he sent me this guitar, and I'm just like, wow. He like literally memorized the color, um, mm. which is pretty amazing. And that's got you know more of a Strat sound. It's got the um. Uh, Lawler pickups in it, so it's a little bit thicker sounding than a Strat because I like the mm -hmm. thicker, I like thicker sounds versus the, like the. Uh, and then on the far left, that's the Novo guitar made by Dennis Fano and out of Nashville, Tennessee. So mm -hmm. you know, all three of them are amazing. Um, we did, you know, on tour we had the most amazing crew. We're just like a family. Uh, we're traveling mm -hmm. together, and and it was just incredible. You know, we're, we're, like uh, my tech at the time was uh, Patrick and. He was in charge of what my feet would usually do if I had equipment on stage. So when you hear the tone change, he's pushing the buttons. So I have to have the utmost trust in him. And Victor was my, my tech for Broadway. And he had the same thing. He like, I trust these guys so much because, you know, you think about once in a lifetime when the guitar goes, dong, 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 that, that heavy yeah. part, he's, he's got to be there to hit that change that patch so you have that big sound at that moment. The drummers had hundred, hundreds of little pieces of instruments, little things. And so we had Great. one guy there handing everybody the right stuff to put on their harnesses. So there's a, a lot of motion, a lot of stuff going on backstage. <laughs> But 2020, January was great. We're still doing the show. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, you know, great little after shows where a lot of artists, you know, a lot of people I admire were coming to see the show. So that was amazing to get to meet a lot of people. Um, and then David's show, I think we ended around February 16th. So mm. at the time, COVID didn't affect us. Like we finished our show, I think February 15th, 16th, 2020. A week later, we performed on SNL. And like a week after that, the world shut down. So oh, this will be taken care of by the time our show comes back in September. And mm. but then the uncertainty started to come, you know, come in, and we're just like, okay, we don't know if the show's gonna happen, and we, we're all we're all on the same boat now. Things just start getting pushed aside, um, which has been you know pretty detrimental to a lot, a lot of the music industry, and you know, a lot of people are suffering. You know, a lot of technicians. Mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of jobs, people behind the scenes, ushers, concessions, not, not just the people you, you see on stage. Like this is a whole economy that's been just ripped to shreds. And, you know, people have to realize that like, it's not, these are livelihoods. And unlike other things, reopening quicker, this is gonna take some time. I don't know if touring is gonna come back for quite some time because each country is gonna have different regulations as they open up. I, I think more residential shows are gonna make more sense, like Cirque du Soleil in Vegas versus Cirque du Soleil touring. Mostly I've been interested in like the stock market and cryptocurrency, which I had learned about back in 2017. I was doing beta testing at Intel with Invisible Instruments up in like, Seattle and Portland. And at lunch, these tech guys were talking about crypto and I got really interested in it because I used to live with guys from Harvard in 2005 and they were talking about Facebook and I, would, I ignored that. And I, and I was like, that was the biggest mistake I would, they told me to invest in it in 2004. And I was like, what, what is a Facebook? Dumbest thing I ever heard. So 12 years later, these other tech guys were talking. I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna listen to them this time. And so visiting family, not so much I'd like to, but with just all the restrictions and stuff, I just wanna be safe. I kind of spread myself a little too thin at the beginning of the pandemic, like, I'm just trying to be there for everyone. There's a lot of racial issues still going on in the country, which haven't stopped. Like, you know, police shootings didn't stop just because the pandemic happened. Um, I've been bike, been bike riding with David a lot last spring and summer. 
uh, and a couple, another friend of mine, but oh, there's a book. Where was this? I cannot remember, but this was on tour. We, you know, that was David's rule number one. Everybody needs a bike. And so we got foldable bikes. I have a friend from Amsterdam that I hang out with a lot here in New York and, you know, she, you know, she rides her bike. I mean, bicyclist is just a great way to see anything. And I totally agree. And so I haven't been playing much guitar, but I, I was like, I want to change one of my guitars. So I went and I put all these rhinestones on it and took some super glue. You bedazzled like, your axe. I bedazzled it. And then I played one chord and stopped. And then I put it back away. But I, I, I'll be honest, I have been feeling kind of down and out about music recently just because I miss it so much. And then you start thinking, what is it all for? Will it come back? How will it come back? And, you know, and just having the inspiration to write again, because I, I, I'm inspired by my fellow musicians. And when I'm not around them and immersed in it, you start losing that spark. And yeah. seeing the love that Chick Korea has for music and that message he gave to all of us musicians and non-musicians alike was just enough for me just to snap out of it. I'm like, he's totally right. He's totally right. Prince likes to go oh, to music. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, go ahead. It might be later, no, 2008. No, it was like around 2008 or nine. Mm -hmm. I, I think 2009. Uh, he likes to go to music venues and scout musicians. And I remember seeing him like in the distance at different venues at the Roxy and some other places in LA, uh, uh, the key club on sunset. Yeah. And I was playing these jam sessions and some, somebody from his camp reached out to me and said, you know, we come to Paisley park. And, you know, so I did, I did. And I was just freaking out. I, you know, at this time I didn't even have a computer I didn't have anything. I, I was like a broke musician, I, and and I had to learn these songs for a uh, for an audition. I was going to Paisley Park to work with him, and the, the plane lands, and the guy next to me is like, "I just got a text message saying Michael Jackson died. Michael Jackson passed away the day I was flying to meet Prince." We get to Paisley Park. Everybody's just down. Everyone's like, it's a, everyone's mm -hmm. in shock. You know, then fast forward to when Prince passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, Prince passed away like four days after my last grandparent, my grandmother, Dorothy passed away. I was in LA doing some gigs hmm. and she, she passed away. Um, I was on a set break and I get a phone call. My mother's like, Angie, it's time. I said, put the phone to her ear I'm get a little emotional. Let me drink some tea. It'll dry the tear ducts. <laughs> So yeah, so and then like I'm, I'm on stage playing a song, like a song by one of the guys from One Direction as I know she's passing away. And then like four days later, turn on my phone in the morning and said, Prince passed away. And it was just like, oh, just a knife in the heart. It was like the worst week, it was like in 2016. So mm -hmm. yeah, so like, yeah, you know, even in death, it still affects you, but then you wanna keep their legacy going. So mm -hmm. you know, just keep going for them, if not for yourself, so. Mm -hmm. Angie, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for sharing your story with us at campus. Thank you. I had a great time. I really appreciate it. amazing stories in the world and we love sharing them with you. Donations from viewers make it possible. If you like this show and want to see more, please click the donate button below or visit our website, canvaspresents.org. Thank you. Thank you.